All right. Hello, everyone. I have about 10 minutes, so I'll keep this talk very short, I hope. Uh, so this is what it would solidity would look like if it was built today. It would look like Rust. End of talk. Thanks for coming. OK, that was, that was a joke. There's actually 22 more slides, so I'll try and go through them quickly. What I'm going to show today is a sequence of code transformations from a very simple example that will show you how you could improve the ergonomics and security of Solidity slowly but surely. So here's a very simple example. Uh, I realize this might be a little bit small, so if you're in the back, maybe squint a little bit. Uh, if not, maybe look at a recording. Uh, but you have a interface here for some minter, uh, and then you have a contract that implements this interface. Now, there's a few, a few subtleties here. Uh, first of all, we, uh, we note that the, the function mint doesn't actually use any ether that's sent to it, right? Uh, it'll, it'll perform some signature recovery, then it'll mint to some storage slot. I'm kind of telling you what the comment does. But it won't actually use the ether that's sent to it, but it has the payable keyword. This is kind of like foreshadowing something we're going to talk about very soon. If you've been following the drama around you know, Solidity optimizers on Twitter, you'll know, you'll know exactly what I'll say about payable. Okay, so we'll start, about, we'll start with this interface here. Uh, first of all, this is a bit unergonomic uh, because if I just look at uh, the function mint, its implementation, it has an override there, sure, but I don't actually know that this function corresponds to a particular interface. Uh, obviously, this trivial example, uh, the contract implements one interface, so it's very easy. But if a contract implements 10 interfaces or you know, inherits from 10 contracts, which themselves inherit from a bunch of other contracts, it's not immediately obvious uh, what this actually implements. Can we clean this up? Let's transform it. Why don't we have a separate notion of an ABI? And then rather than having a contract inherit from another contract, let's make a, con let's make a particular implementation of just that ABI for a contract. So this is using composition rather than inheritance. And if you want to implement some free floating functions for your contract, then there's an input block at the bottom. This is starting to look like Rust a little bit. OK, uh, what can we do? What, can, what else can we do? First of all, we know payable. Uh, the first issue with this payable thing is it's a keyword, uh, and it's also a function modifier. So it does this really bizarre thing where it's not just a keyword that you know, exists, pure, uh, exists you know, in, in the ether. It's also a function modifier, so it's very bizarre because it doesn't it doesn't behave like the other keywords that you attach to functions here, like external or viewer or whatever. Uh, could we do something better? How about we do something like what Rust does? Instead of having a keyword, let's move it into an annotation. Right. So now we're not taking up an entire keyword for this payable. Uh, this gives us two properties. The first one is we would like to reduce the number of keywords our language has. Because every single keyword you add is an extra thing that every single third-party tool must account for. And it also means that old code that may use those keywords is not broken. It has to be changed manually. Uh, the second thing we would like to do with this is rather than have a keyword that adds code that is executed at runtime, why don't we perform a compile time check around method payability? So if you try to call a function that is non-payable, that should be a compile time error. In other words, it's a zero cost abstraction. Doing it at runtime means that you end up with Solidity optimizers just putting payable literally everywhere, and they don't actually use it for its intended purpose. And this will always happen. People always try to optimize for gas. Therefore, you should promote zero cost abstractions. You, can mo you should move things from runtime into compile time wherever possible. OK, great. This is looking great. We note something with these two, which is that by default, we want things to be secure, so you don't really need to explicitly say that something is non-payable. Well, let's just, let us remove them. OK. Uh, now we look at this uh, external here. We can do the same thing, right? where we turn them into annotations. Again, we're making this cleaner in terms of keywords. OK, so now we dive into this EC recover. Uh, again, this is a keyword, right? It's a keyword for some functionality. And there's many, many such keywords, right? There's block height, there's block hash, there's message, and then within messages like message sender and so on, right? There's a bunch of keywords for these. Uh, do we need to have them be keywords? Not necessarily. Why don't we put them in some different namespace so they don't collide with functions that people might want to write? OK, so why don't we make a standard library? The standard library will use the compiler intrinsic of the EC recover, which can be domain-separated in some obscure implementation-defined way that users don't need to know about. 
And if you want to use it, well, you just import the standard library. Right? This avoids the need for an extra keyword for every single one of these functionalities that you add. OK. On to the next thing, which is that EC Recovery here returns an address. Now, we have a bit of time, because I've been going fast. But who can tell me what subtle thing do I have to watch for in this address that is returned? Someone yell that out. You. Check that it's not zero. That's fantastic, right? So this is, follows a very old C-style paradigm for ha error handling, where you have to check magic values. So if the signature recovery is unsuccessful, it'll set the address to zero. This is like a magic value that you have to remember to check. And in our little example here, we haven't checked it. Many protocols have been exploited because they say, oh, OK, I'll just easy recover. It must give me the correct address. But it doesn't always. Sometimes it'll give you the zero address, right? But we know that the zero address, no one knows this public key, we hope. So you know, the easy recover should never correctly actually return the zero address. That's why it's used as an error code. But this is very unergonomic for a developer. It's very unsafe, because there's no explicit error handling. OK, so instead of returning uh, some, magic, some magic number zero, why don't we make it return a result? For those of you who are familiar with Rust, uh, a result is a generic sum type that includes what, the underlying type that you want, in this case, an address. And it also includes an error variant. And when you call this, um, this function down here on wrap on a result, if it's an error, then it'll actually just panic. And in the context of this, you know, let's say this supposed smart contract language, you know, it'll just be a revert. So this is explicit error handling. You literally cannot use the underlying address unless you first unwrap the result. So you don't have to worry about, oh, have I remembered to check this magic number zero? It's like, you have to unwrap that. Otherwise, you cannot get access to the address. OK, so this is much safer. Uh, we can clean this up a little bit by putting it all in one line. Uh, now, we note one thing, which is that this line here, we know the type of A. We know its address, right? Because, I mean, easy recover returns a result with the two with a with a it's a sum type over an address and an error so we know that if you unwrap that result it either panics or it's an address so we don't actually need to explicitly tell the compiler that a is an address why does why doesn't the compiler just infer it right uh, and to do this if you if you keep the type description on the left uh, then you need to introduce something like a keyword, like auto, for instance, which is a C++ have, and it's not exactly very good. So why don't we put the type description to the right, kind of like, like what Rust does, and we introduce a new, a new keyword, uh, let, right? So when you declare a new local variable, you say let local variable, and then you provide the, the type description on the right. Well, now it's very convenient because you no longer rely on this you know, auto or this address, or you no longer rely on the type being on the left, to be able to declare a variable, let is the keyword that tells you I'm declaring a variable. So we can just we can just take this address here on the right and we remove it. Now hopefully you see that this is uh, some you know if we transform Solidity slowly but surely into a language like this, it would provide much uh, much more safety uh, in the form of things like explicit error handling, in the form of zero cost abstractions and compile time checks for things like visibility and state mutability and so on at compile time. And if we was took it one step further, we can actually clean this up and make it look much more like Rust, uh, where rather than having you know large large uh, type names like u int and the number of bits, well, well, I mean, we know it's an integer to say u8, and you're done, right? Uh, yeah, so this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. I, I should also point out that uh, if you looked at uh, if you looked at you know this last slide over here, and this is the kind of language that you would like to build, you have two options. One of them is you can actually start contributing to the Solidity compiler and the Solidity Solidity language, and slowly move it towards these kind of guarantees, which I'm sure they would very much appreciate. Alternatively, you could come uh, slide into my DMs uh, if you're a compiler engineer and you want to build this language. Uh, we're building this. It's called Sway at Fuel Labs. Uh, and if you are interested in building on this language and using it, we're also hiring application engineers. So also slide into my DMs for both of those cases. OK, thank you.
Um, what about uh, the linear type uh, slash ownership model? Would you pour that to the this shining new language? Uh, would you would you pour the linear type or the ownership model also to this? You could. There's not much reason to have a borrow tracker like Rust has because there's no notion of multithreading. Like, sure, it can help a little bit, but it's much less necessary. Uh, in terms of linear types, I think there's like a lot of debate around even if Rust has linear types. So there's one of those things that's like, you don't, you don't really need it. It's more like an academic thing. Right. I, I do have a use case, but I, I, I think we could chat later, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, how do I phrase this? So I think uh, in your presentation you kind of alluded to the idea that if we change the syntax of Solidity, we make it safer or the contracts more secure. But uh, like, what makes you think that is really the case? Given that I, I think most of the safety we have in uh, Solidity contract implementations today is, I think, because we as a community have like understood most. Uh, like ch challenges and like where exploits happen. So I would assume like switching to a syntax like Rust, for example, would just probably reopen a lot of these uh, like problems. People would start like misunderstanding some syntax again, and then you know we would like re we would have to rebuild all of the quote unquote best practices we have today with Solidity, for example. That's a po yeah. That's a possibility that. A change in the syntax uh, and the change in the semantics of the language may lead to having to relearn some things. That being said, I'll counter the argument that uh, we've learned how to write Solidity securely by saying even in 2022, people have reentrancy bugs. That would be caught if the compiler was doing its job. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just want to add two tiny comments. So the first one is. Uh, Unfortunately, I mean, I would like, I would really like to do uh, compile time checking of, of payability, but that would require a virtual machine that enforces that, so we have to do that runtime. If you use Sway, then you compile to a virtual machine that I, I'm not sure. I think it does support that, so it's much easier. Can I, can I answer that question yeah, before sure. you dive into the second one? Yeah. So uh, you are correct that compile time payability checking does not guarantee that all possible cases will be caught at compile time because you could have something like a smart contract wallet where you just don't know what function you're calling uh, beforehand. Uh, however, I will claim that the amount of gas that is spent on payability and the fact that optimizers today, in other words, the actual users of the language rather than the people that designed the language, are starting to use payable everywhere to avoid this runtime check uh, shows that it is not going to actually be used by developers. That the, regardless of our desire to have developers use it, no one's going to use it eventually. And this check shouldn't be done by the EVM. It should be done by wallets. There's no reason why MetaMask, which is not even open source, should not have to do work so that every single person who runs an Ethereum phone mode has to spend their like a very scarce amount of you know, scarce amount of the block space to do these runtime checks. MetaMask should just do it. Yeah, I, I disagree because it's not just external wallets. It can also can also be type confusions uh, and so on. So I'm I'm not willing to uh, save gas uh, and and uh, endanger ether being stuck. But um, and the th second thing um, I don't know. I mean type inference that is uh, why do you have so much echo here? Um, yeah, I'm personally not a big fan of that, and we had that before. We had a keyword called var, which would just yeah auto infer the type from the right hand side, and it led to some problems. So we went actually the other direction and removing remove that. Oh, I mean that's that's a good argument. I wouldn't inherently disagree, and yeah. that's like a fairly small thing. Uh, type inference has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. So if there if the, if like the user say I really wish I'd express the types everywhere, then there's no need to do type inference, yes. But the other things are really good. So this, yeah, I don't know. Moving stuff into a standard library, uh, reducing the clutter in the, in the global name says that's all the things we were doing, yeah. So if anyone wants to help these guys out, write the Solidity compiler and language, help them out. <laughs>